Well, gang, it is time for another unboxing video, although, as you can see, oops, we're already unboxed. Uh, that's because after filming this video and sitting down to do the editing, I realized I had no sound. I have absolutely no idea why. So this is going to be take two. We're going to do this all over again. And you'll just have to play along as I feign excitement at seeing a lot of these books, you know, pretend for the first time. <laughs> but hey, I think you'll agree, um, you know, just by these top books here that we've got some fun stuff to look at this time. So if you enjoy looking at and talking about old comic books, well, then stick around. We're going to have some fun. Hey there, Bubby. Welcome to Shanghala. My name is Duke, and this is an unboxing video. And as I noted in the teaser, these books are kind of pre-unboxed. I've already gone through them, but trust me, there is some, some fun stuff in here, in addition to what you saw on kind of the top layer of those piles. We've we've also got some some Atom Age or what I call the Uranium Age books and a few even Golden Age books to look at. So I think this is going to be a, a kind of a fun video. Uh, but uh, you know I don't know what happened. You know I, I'm real I don't say low tech but uh, <laughs> I I just film these videos on my iPad and this is what I've always used for my microphone. Just you know what's what's on the ear pods and I don't know why but for some reason I had no sound this time out so if I sound like I'm just kind of shouting in the air to you <laughs> that's because that's exactly what I'm doing uh, so if, if you're a youtuber if you have uh, any experience any advice on microphone and uh, and camera setups and please do by all means leave a comment down below uh, or maybe get a hold of me, uh, direct message me, or or publicly, I don't care, um, on eBay, uh, at, uh, not eBay, uh, <laughs> on Twitter, uh, at Shanghala is uh, is the handle. And uh, I would be happy to, to take any advice you have on uh, YouTubing, whether it is camera setups, microphone setups, or or even just, you know, how I perform and sound in these videos. Uh, otherwise... Uh, <laughs> Let's uh, let's not waste a lot of time. Take one of this video. It took about 40 minutes. I, I'm going to go a little quicker this time. I'm going to try to anyway because I think one of the reasons I don't get a lot of hits on these videos uh, is because yeah, they go too long. <laughs> so, you know, I love comic books. I geek out on them. But uh, apparently, you know, the average YouTube video viewer can, can only take just so much of me in one sitting. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, that's all right, I guess. Um, right up front, uh, please do like, share, subscribe, do all of the groovy things, especially share. Uh, I think if, if you get any enjoyment out of these videos, you'd like to see this channel grow, then sharing is probably the best thing that you can do. Just dash this off to somebody else you know that, uh, that likes comic books and say, hey, you know, check this out. Uh, maybe you'll like this too. Uh, the other thing uh, you to let you know, uh, I am grading these books for uh, sale on eBay. The seller name is .com Comics. That's what I do for a living. About 80% of my work week is grading books. This really isn't a commercial for .com Comics, uh, but uh, the reason I do these videos, as I mentioned before, is just to share that that love and enjoyment of comic books and the fact that you know when these books are sorted, you know, by the company owner uh, for grading, the ones that we're going to sell as singles. I grab one of those boxes. I've got no idea what is in that box, and it's always just just so much fun. It kind of replicates that that awe and 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 amazement that I had, that gosh wow feeling uh, that I had as a kid going to the newsstand and just never knowing what you were going to find. And there's some of that in this video in this box. Uh, there were a lot of things that I have, frankly, even though I have been collecting comic books probably longer than you've been alive, uh, some things that I've never seen in the wild before. So again, this I think will be a, a fun video. Um, fun for me anyway. <laughs> so let's get right to it. Uh, first off, Adventure Comics 294. This uh, is from 1962. Uh, icons of the age, John F. Kennedy, uh, Marilyn Monroe, and even, even Jerry Lewis. 
<laughs> so you may not know it. Um, Adventure Comics, uh, of course, you know, started out as an anthology. And as time went on, as the book shrank and shrank and shrank to try and keep first 10. And then when they finally reluctantly went up 12 cents uh, to keep that price point, they had to shrink the books. And so they would shed features as time went on. Uh, and by this time, by the early 60s, it got down to just Superboy and one backup feature. And uh, for a short time, about 15, 18 issues or so, the backup feature was John Fort. The Legion, of course, would start in Adventure 300, and Fort uh, was the artist on that, just continuing on from, from the Bizarro feature. And, you know, uh, John Fort's art worked well, I think, for mystery books, for romance books. It really wasn't suited uh, to superheroes, but it did, strangely enough, uh, his, his kind of stiff, angular style did fit Bizarro's. So that's a little bit of what John Fort's Bizarro looked like. The lead story is, of course, your, your typical Superboy story. And uh, another interesting thing, where's the letters page? I've already looked at this book, of course. Um... You, if you if you collect the Legion at all in the Adventure Era books, you know that the letters column had a section called Bits of Legionnaire Business, where readers would write in and suggest different character names and power sets for potential new Legionnaires. Well, that was actually born out of this original column, Bits of Bizarro Business, where readers would suggest different wacky things that the Bizarros would do. <laughs> you know, like... like um, uh, Stuart Fisher of Brooklyn, New York, suggested uh, um, on Bizarro World, the parents show their love for children by decreasing their allowance. <laughs> well, of course they would. Uh, Ralph Cohen of St. Paul, Minnesota, on the Bizarro World, their newspapers feature ads on the front page and important news in the back. <laughs> of course, uh, <laughs> if you are a youngling, you probably wonder what a newspaper is. <laughs> So, uh, <laughs> be that as it may, uh, Giant Batman Annual, and this one's in, you know, kind of decent shape. Um, interesting here, uh, this is obviously before uh, Earth 3 was invented, uh, before Robin grew up to become Nightwing, he was actually Owl Man. Uh, so, and, and that's something that I think somebody could do something with today the Owl Man persona for uh, Dick Grayson. Maybe, I don't know. But, I mean, this is fun. You know, the Zebra Batman, the Phantom Batman, Rip Van Batman, <laughs> Merman Batman. Why wouldn't he be Bat Merman? I want, well, I don't know. Uh, Aquaman number two. So that's a cool book. Now in a magazine of his own. And, uh, a little bit of what that looked like inside. Now this is uh, this is pretty cool. I'm not going to open it up because you can see uh, the owner. And, and by the way, if you want to see uh, our collections unboxed as they come in from collections all over the world, they come into our warehouse in Freeport, Maine. There is a YouTube channel called Sell My Comic Books. And you can see the uh, company co-owner, Sean, and generally uh, one of our employees, also named Sean, unboxing those comics and, uh, and you know, sorting them into different, uh, different sets, different uh, sales outlets. And that's how, you know, the singles, the ones that we would expect to sell on eBay for, say, between 10 and 100 bucks, that's how those end up here. Uh, but anyway, you can, uh, you can watch uh, those videos and see uh, a, a lot more, see sort of the first step you know, before things arrive on my desk. But anyway, where I was going, Sean has apparently already looked at this book and realized the centerfold is detached. So I'm not going to take this out of the bag just yet. I'll wait until I get down to the actual grading. God, that Comics Code stamp is huge. <laughs> but uh, that is a, uh, a Marvel Atlas comic from the, uh, from the uh, 50s. Atlas was the name of the distribution company owned by uh, Marvel publisher Martin Goodman. And... Uh, so that's where that actually comes from. Black Magic. This is a, a Simon and Kirby title. And uh, this was for Crestwood Publications. This is actually number four. So what do you think of that? 
a little bit of the work inside, and I think that's all pretty much Simon and Kirby. And it's funny, here and there you can see a little more Simon, you can see a little more Kirby. Doc Savage. This one isn't in great shape, but this is the uh, first issue of the Gold Key Doc Savage run, mid-60s. Uh, mid Got some problems here in the back cover, obviously. Apache Kid. This is another uh, Marvel Atlas book from the uh, mid-50s. Not going to open this one up because it's got some issues. A lot of these books are kind of low grade. This one is horrible. This one, I'm actually not even going to grade. This is incomplete. I can feel by the um, by the thickness of this, this is missing pages. So I'll probably throw that right in a dollar box, if if even that really. But that's the first Silver Age appearance of the uh, of the Scarecrow. Now this one, even without a cover, it'll be an easy grade, right? What's the grade? No grade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but even without the cover, Captain Marvel Jr. number 97 from 1951, um, that, that'll that be uh, a good thing to put on eBay. I need to check it, make sure all the pages are there. You note any defects such as that rip. But um, that should still, even without a cover, that will probably do pretty well on eBay. Some more coverless books. This is Detective Comics number 203. This one's got some obviously issues, even irrespective of not having a cover. Crimes of the Catwoman. Where is she? There she is. And uh, who else we have here? Uh, Roy Raymond, TV detective. And. Who else is in here? Misto, Magician Detective. You don't see much of Misto anymore. <laughs> maybe uh, maybe Grant Morrison or somebody will revive Misto. Somebody took a crayon to this page for some reason. Huh. All right. This one is Detective Comics number 195. City Without Guns. That's crazy. Who could imagine such a thing? Robot Man, you know, the uh, the Robot Man uh, series, I forget the name of the artist, I'll have to look it up, but he was quite good, and uh, I would actually buy a collected edition of all of the old Robot Man stories by that artist, I wish I could remember his name, but his art's very charming. We also had Pow Wow Smith, and of course Batman and Robin, and... That's just kind of a random story. Hmm. All right. All-American Western. This is shortly after the conversion to Western because this is issue number 111 or one. No, I'm sorry, 117. And uh, it was 103 when we converted over to um, Western themes and remade Johnny Thunder as a, uh, as a cowboy. Again, not a high grade, but you should do at least... At least 10 bucks. This is interesting. This is quality comics. Candy. Got an unfortunate giant ass rip here uh, across the front. And some issues on the spine. That looks like maybe bug chews. But uh, this is of the working girl genre. And you see that on television, of course, you know, in sitcoms ranging from Mary Tyler Moore to Two Broke Girls. But as far as I know, and Sound off in the comments below if, if you know differently. But uh, as far as I know, uh, it was really comics that really kind of um, broke the working girl genre. You know, with things like Patsy Walker, Millie the Model. There's a rip on an interior page, unfortunately. Rims. That's a weird name. So, here's a little bit of what that looks like inside. Blazing West. Uh, this is an ACG book. Cover by Ogden Whitney, who you probably know as the uh, creator of Herbie. Not Herbie the Love Bug, but Herbie the... Um, oh, what was his name? The Herbie Poppendecker... Oh, the Fat Fury. 
<laughs> so anyway, ACG was a sister company to DC. Uh, it was um, uh, operated by, I believe it was the son-in-law of Harry Donenfeld, who was the owner of DC Comics. Um, and it's kind of surprising that DC, you know, they acquired characters from from Charlton and Quality and, of course, Fawcett. Um, it's, but they, they don't seem to have acquired any of the ACG characters, and they had a few. Uh, they had uh, Nemesis and Magic Man. Um, these are characters that, as far as I know, are now in the public domain. And this was interesting, uh, only because I, I have a lot of, maybe even most of, the EC comics in reprint form. You know, the Russ Cochran reprints, the Gemstone reprints. Um, this may be the, the first time I've actually held an actual EC original comic in my hand. So this is Crime Suspense, Crime Suspense Stories, number 21. And uh, very, very typical uh, EC horror going on in there. Is that page ripped? Oh, it is. Oh, it's about a, uh, about a quarter of that page missing, and it does affect some of those panels. That's too bad. Um, so that was something I did not notice on the first go through with, uh, with these books. But well, that's pretty cool. What do you think, Stan? You enjoying that? I think we're going to see some books that you did here uh, as we as we go into this pile some more. So here is House of Secrets, uh, 89 from the early 70s. Uh, DC, just before it gave up the ghost on romance comics, had a kind of a brief flirtation with the gothic romance genre, uh, you know, as evidenced by the title um, Forbidden Tales of Dark Mansion, which was also a Dark Mansion of Forbidden Love. And this uh, this cover is very evocative of the covers on that title. Uh, so there you go. It looks like somebody did a little math here on the front cover. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> you find all kinds of crazy things in comics. I've done some videos. Uh, um, a recent video I did, you can go back and look it up in my history of uh, a, a copy of Journey into Mystery that um, some kid had just totally vandalized and, and written all kinds of things in. We're going to run of uh, mid-70s giant size books here. Here's giant size Spider-Man and Dracula with a little bit of Human Torch for good measure. Um, well, there'll be more later, I guess. Uh, Katie Keene from 1959. This has got, unfortunately, a little bit of a... Um, uh, paper abrasion there on the front. You know, and it's surprising um, when we get these Katie Keene books, you know, with the paper doll stuff inside, I don't normally find them all cut up. Oh, look, some holes here in the spine, and that also looks like some bug chew going on. Um, but I don't usually find Katie Keene's all cut up, which you would think probably they would be. Most every issue had some kind of paper doll stuff in it. So, there's that. Journey into Fear, Superior Comics. I think Superior uh, is a Canadian company. Um, there's a maple leaf, I think, on the cover, on the logo. Um, and generally, they did uh, a reprints, I think, of earlier, of earlier stuff. But, <laughs> you need a tool set? There was a time you could order a tool set through comic books. Um... So I'll have to look up. I don't know if this one is original material or if this is reprints of something. Haunted Harbor. Oh, no. Oh, no. Look. Ghost Bride. Oh. Here's some more giant uh, size stuff. Giant size Spider-Man and Doc Savage. The title's just Giant Size Spider-Man, but each one had a, uh, a co-star. And... Uh, Marvel, when it did Doc Savage, took the whole Man of Bronze title, quite literally, and actually colored him bronze. Giant Size Supervillain Team Up number one. And this one, the, the, the spine is pretty square. 
See, there's a thing about these um, 70s giant size books. Uh, you often get the spines crushed. And I don't know if that was, you know, how they came off the press or if that's just, you know, handling and storage compression over the years. Maybe a combination of both factors. But uh, you often find the spines all mangled. Even when there are no rips or tears and the rest of the book looks good, when I grade it, I've got to knock off some just because the spine isn't square. It's, it's, it's crushed and pressed flat. Giant Size Defenders, number one, a fabulous first edition. Valkyrie in the inset, but doesn't warrant <laughs> part of the team busting through. Giant Size Defenders, number three. Daredevil makes the cover this time, but, uh, but not Valkyrie again. Giant Size Avengers with the, uh, with the All Winners squad. Giant Size Conan. Power of the Dragon. See, and this one's got a nice spine, too. Here we go. Hulk number 102. Big premiere issue. That's because it had been Tales to Astonish. And then in the uh, late 60s, after uh, Marvel, um, you know, got out of the chokehold that it was under from DC Comics. Of course, it had its own distributor, Atlas Comics, but in the mid-50s, Martin Goodman, uh, one of his employees, talked him into shutting down the Atlas distribution and outsourcing distribution to American News. That was a poor decision because it was only a few months after they threw in with American News that that whole company imploded under the weight of a, a federal, uh, I think it was racketeering, um, or something like that. Um, it, it, and they should have known the company was under investigation at that time. But anyway, uh, when American News imploded, it left Marvel high and dry. They had to go hat in hand to Independent News, which was the distributor owned by DC Comics. And um, DC put a chokehold on them, said we'll only distribute a maximum of eight titles per month. Well, once, uh, you know, the uh, late 60s came along and... Um, and uh, DC sold into the Kinney Corporation and eventually Warner Brothers. Its new corporate overlords didn't see the wisdom, I guess, of holding Marvel down. And that allowed Marvel to kind of spread its wings a little bit, add more titles. And so all of the books, Tales of Suspense, Tales to Astonish, Strange Tales, there were two firsts that had two heroes in the book because Marvel could only publish so many books. Each of those split. So why do I mention all of this? Well, because I think it was deemed at the time that the Hulk was less popular than Submariner. Tales to Astonish, of course, starred, you know, the Hulk and the Submariner. And uh, at this time, conventional wisdom was that a high issue number was good. A low issue number was bad because it was a new product. It was untested. Distributors... Retailers might not carry it, might not stock it, um, because they would have no idea if it would sell. A high issue number indicated something that sold well. So when all of those books split, um, Tales to Astonish, Tales of Suspense, Strange Tales, what you saw is that the character that was perceived as the least popular kept the numbering of the original title, whereas the one who was perceived by good old Stan here as maybe being more popular um, could maybe sustain a number one in the uh, marketplace as it existed at that time. Again, number one's frowned upon. These days, Marvel will bend over backwards and do anything. It would make every issue of a series a number one if it could. <laughs> so it's just sort of interesting to me that the Hulk was the one who ended up having more legs, even though the evidence would seem to suggest that uh, Stan thought that uh, the Hulk was maybe less popular than the Submariner. So... That's my story on that. <laughs> Giant Size Dog Savage, again, uh, very bronze. Uh, Mind-boggling movie issue. So this adapts the, um, the movie. There was a Doc Savage movie in the uh, mid-'70s, which, as I understand it, was um, pretty horrific. <laughs> Not very good at all. All right, here is another pile. And uh, 
this is Human Torch. So this this is actually a reprint series. Uh, the Human Torch uh, starred in Strange Tales. And he got a feature in Strange Tales not long after the Fantastic Four made its debut. Within a dozen issues or so, uh, the Torch was broken out into his own series. And I think probably, Stan, tell me if I'm wrong... I think the the belief was that having been a Golden Age character, having been popular in the 40s, that the Torch, and also being a teenage character, you know, at a time when, you know, teenagers were believed to be the primary reading audience of comic books, young teenagers, um, or even prepubescents, um, it was believed the Human Torch was going to be the breakout star of the Fantastic Four, and he was given his own series in Strange Tales. Um well, that didn't really happen. The Thing turned out to be the most popular character, and it was only maybe a dozen or issues or so into the Torch's run in uh, in Strange Tales that the Thing started to co-star, and then eventually uh, they both went away. They lost out to um, who took over in Strange Tales? Oh, Nick Fur Nick Fury. Uh, so um, so yeah. Anyway, this series from the early seventies reprints those early. Um, strange tales stories. So if you can't afford the strange tales books, this might be an alternative to read those stories. And I would be kind of tempted. These have all been set aside as singles, and I think there's some more in here as well. I'd be tempted to sell those as a set. But uh, Incredible Hulk 178. This is all about Warlock. Um, I never really understood the appeal of Warlock myself, but there it is. This is, uh, there's a note stuck in it. This is Journey into Unknown Worlds number seven. So this is a Marvel Atlas book. And I'm going to have to check it for completeness because it feels a little thin. That's a Basil Wolverton right there, I believe. Yes, boom. Look at that. How clever am I? I was able to spot that right away. <laughs> and I did not know that from the first go through. So uh, the Gunhawk. Is this a Marvel Atlas book? Yes, there it is right there. So, of course, through the 50s, um, and this has got some extra staples added. That spine's pretty ragged. But through the 50s, uh, Marvel just chased any and all genres. Here's a cover by Joe, Joe Manley. And uh, it's sort of interesting to think about, you know, on some, some world of the multiverse, what... Marvel might have looked like had Joe Manley lived. Uh, uh, of course, if you don't know the story, uh, he was a victim of kind of a freak accident. He was hit by a train, if I recall. But he was a good friend of Stan Lee and um, Stan's favorite artist. And so you you don't know. You know, Kirby, Jack Kirby, and, and to a lesser degree, Steve Ditko, both really only ended up at Marvel um, because... Um, Joe Manley had to be replaced. And had that not occurred, if Kirby hadn't found a place at Marvel, maybe the Marvel Age of Comics, um, Fantastic Four One and everything else never would have happened. Or, at the very least, had it still happened, um, you might have seen Joe Manley maybe being the artist on Spider-Man instead of, of Steve Ditko or on you know, Iron Man or whatever else. So... Uh, and he was he was quite a good artist, especially on his covers. So here's an early Kid Cult Outlaw, number 13. Again, a Marvel book, Marvel Atlas. Here's an early Pep, Pep number 154. He says he's always called a creep, and it bugs him. Get it? Ha <laughs> ha! Now, uh, one thing I saw when I opened this up the first time, We've got a uh, a fly story in here, Adventures of the Fly, and it also has Little Jinx and some Katie Keene fashion dolls. Finally, we get to the Archie, looking very Archie as Archie did for many many decades. Here's a a Marvel Tales. This was a uh, a horror book for a while. This is early 50s. Kind of love the, the dripping logo. And see, 
Now you might assume to look at this with that signature right there, you might assume that this book was by our pal Stanley, uh, the story I mean, that it was actually drawn by him, but of course it was not. Stan could not draw, uh, his brother could, uh, and so Stan just wrote this. Um, and I'd have to look up, oh, right here, Joe Manley is who did the actual art. See, Stan gets the big, the big uh, byline, you know, and then Joe just has to tuck his signature down here in the corner. Almost, he was like, <laughs> maybe, maybe Joe didn't like Stan as much as Stan liked Joe. This looks very much like, a, you know what? Fuck you, Stan. I'm putting my name on it anyway. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. See, I like this logo better than this one. Very, very uh, kind of straight and static. And of course, yeah, as the 50s wore on, the title kind of transformed from horror um, to, because of the comics code, more of a um, mystery title. Here's an early Ghost Rider appearance, Marvel Spotlight number 10. And this is cool, I think. Marvel 2 and 1 number 1. Man-Thing here, Thing versus Man-Thing. Uh, I don't know if we've got maybe a, 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 a drought going on in the story or what, but Man-Thing's usually uh, green, and here he's looking kind of brownish, looking like he could use a watering. But anyway, uh, Thing team-up started in, I think it was Marvel Feature, and uh, apparently they sold well enough to warrant giving the Thing his own title. And that lasted, this title lasted like a hundred issues, so. Uh, OMAC, One Man Army, number two. I think we've got the whole thing here. Or, or much of it anyway. So yeah, here's number one. Now OMAC number one is a hard book to find in high grade, even when, even when, like this one, it's got few, if any, detectable creases or tears you know, you look at that book initially, and you might want to call it a, a, a 9 at least, maybe even a 9 too, but this white cover it didn't age well at all. And as you can see, I don't know how well you can see it on the camera actually, um, but it's, it's yellowing here in the center. And a lot of times, you know, books will, will uh, age from the edges in, but this is probably coming through from the inside. So that is some yellowing here. That's always creeped me out, too, by the way. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, this is, that's going to take down from the grade, you know, point and a half anyway. Uh, but, like I said, OMAC number ones are, are not easy to find in, in a true high grade, at least if they're being graded accurately. There are a lot of people who don't take into account, you know, cover gloss or, or cover condition. I mean, um, cover gloss or paper condition, um, you know, they just look for tears and stuff. So there's OMAC number three and number four. All right, Let's push those off to the side. Let's see what we've got here. A couple of books. Uh, again, another working girl book, Millie the Model. Spine's a little ragged, but I think this one's going to do well, again, because it's not a book you find much much of in the marketplace, and this I think is a true golden age. This is 19... where does it say? 1949. So there you go. There's a little bit of what it looks like inside. And then Lana. Not Lana Lang, although she is a redhead. Somebody signed their name all over this. The um, spine is in even worse condition with some extra staples added. But she looks actually kind of more Lucy than Lana, if you want to know the truth. Yeah, let's see what we've got here in this next stack. Uh, there's showcase number 35. So that is the second appearance of the Ray Palmer Adam. <laughs> a 
two things here. Uh, one, uh, I love these little fact pages that DC did uh, during this era. Uh, and then also this ad. If you were a kid um, at this time and sent away for that frontier cabin, what you actually got, I swear to God, was a cardboard box <laughs> painted to look like a frontier cabin. Uh, <laughs> So that's how they could sell five of them for four bucks. It was just a cardboard box. But hey, when I was a kid, I loved playing with cardboard boxes. So uh, sometimes more than the toy that was inside. Uh, Silver Surfer. Now, this is a great uh, iconic cover, but it's pretty clear that Spider-Man uh, was used to kind of goose sales of uh, the Surfer, even though this was by all accounts and by his own testament, uh, this was Stan Lee's favorite title that he ever did. Uh, it, it didn't last that long, and apparently it just didn't take hold in the marketplace. The title only lasted like 18 issues. Uh, and so at issue 14, I think they were using Spider-Man to try and goose the sales a little bit. Now, <laughs> do you like Jack Kirby? Do you like Sandman? Do you need a Sandman number one? Well... We got you covered. And they're all pretty high grade. These are all going to be eight, eight fives, maybe even a nine or a nine two in here. Uh, we won't sell these all at once. We'll parcel these out, you know, one a day or one a week or whatever. But um, boy, golly, if you want a Sandman number one, we've got one for you. And those probably, you know, if you want to know the truth, these Sandmans probably never even made the newsstand. I mean, they look in that good a condition. I don't think some collector bought, how many are here, 10 issues or 12 issues of Sandman. This is probably like a warehouse find. These are books that never even got distributed, which probably helps to explain why Sandman only lasted five issues. Uh, that was pretty common of the era, the waning days of the the newsstand era before uh, comic book stores and the game a thing, before the direct market was invented. Um, so I would bet that these books never saw a newsstand. All right, Super Cops, Red Circle. So this is an Archie book. I think this might be an adaptation uh, of a movie or something like that. I'll have to look it up. Because, uh, I mean, this guy's looking very Charles Bronson. He's looking very Burt Reynolds. I like how they've got the little Bat logos on their shirts. I'm surprised that Archie was able to get away with that. <laughs> and I like the... Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm thinking of uh, from Starsky and Hutch, if you're familiar with that show, Huggy Bear. <laughs> this guy looking very uh, black exploitation uh, pimpalicious here. <laughs> But I'll have to look that up. I think it might be based on a movie. This is a cool find. This is a pretty, you know, for a Roy Rogers comic, that's a pretty high-grade book. I mean, it's probably only a six. Um, but, you know, not having been pressed or anything, that's that's pretty good. And this is, uh, you got to look inside with Dells, but this is Roy Rogers number 17 from 1949. That... That's quite a find. We'll see how that does. Uh, sadly, uh, Roy Rogers, Lone Ranger, things like that, they don't they don't do that well for us. I mean, they do well enough. They'll go for, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 bucks. And we normally don't have ones, you know, in as nice shape as this. But they don't go for anywhere near the, the Overstreet book value. Um, so it's a little disappointing in that regard. But uh, you would think this would do well because this should go to not just comic book collectors, but, you know, Western and Roy Rogers fans. But, you know, then again, you know, most people under 40 probably don't even know who Roy Rogers was. So he's kind of a fading, fading memory. Here's a bunch of Shanna the She-Devils. Two, number three. I think these were original stories. I don't think these were reprints. This series didn't last very long. Here's number four and number one. And as with uh, the other thing I talked about there, I would be tempted to sell these as a lot. I think they would do 
better actually as a lot than individually. But they will go up as individual books. So if you like your Jungle Queens, we got some coming at you. Here's a She-Hulk. Probably the last significant thing you did, Stan. Um, although I remember at the time I bought my She-Hulk off the stands. And um, I didn't think much of it. And I don't think I bought number two. <laughs> It was it was like, you know, even at that age, I was like, this is pretty derivative. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, with the upcoming uh, Disney Plus show, um, this book's really taken off. It's got some issues, got some little ink stains here. It's, uh, you know, it's probably only in the 7-ish, 6-5 range. Uh, but uh, that's going to go, that'll be at least a $50 book, I'm sure. I'm sure of it. And here we go. Here is our last stack. And we have here uh, some tomahawks. I don't actually know what issue number this is. I didn't look at it last time. Number four. Holy crap. Now, I like the tomahawks, the early ones with the uh, Fred Ray art. Uh, I don't have many early ones. Actually, I don't have any early ones to speak of. I think my, my earliest tomahawk is probably in the 60s or 70s. But I really like the uh, Tomahawk books. I have a lot of the uh, later run, especially where you know they have Tomahawk, you know, Revolutionary War era, Colonial era character fighting dinosaurs and space aliens. <laughs> but here he was still pretty well. I mean, as authentic as you could be, uh, <laughs> you know, with his little Leonardo da Vinci invention here. And so you may be wondering why is the top third of that missing? That's because uh, back in the day. You know, of course, comic books were not uh, made and marketed then as collectibles. They were uh, disposable consumer goods. You wouldn't think of saving a comic book, for the most part, any more than you would think of saving your, your daily newspaper. Although, again, if you're not a certain age, you probably don't know what a newspaper is. But, <laughs> but um, uh, anyway, uh, they would tear off uh, the top third, the distributor, would tear off the top third of the cover and send it back to the publisher uh, as proof that the book didn't sell uh, and uh, and would just pulp the rest. Because, again, comic books had no real secondary market value at that time. Um, there was no reason to save them. The publisher did not want them back. They just wanted some kind of proof that the book had not sold and that the distributor needed to be credited or you know, or only paid for the books that did sell. Um, and so that would happen. Uh, and uh, what then would happen is that the distributor would sell the remaining book, you know, out the back door or through some um, back market channel. Uh, and and so <laughs> it would end up getting paid twice. They'd, they'd sell the book and then they would get a credit for it because it had been uh, the logo returned as proof that it had not sold. And so that's why, you know, in starting in the Silver Age, once the publishers got hip, you would see here near the Indicia, this big giant lettering saying, you know, the book may not be sold in a, a uh, mutilated uh, or torn condition. And that was because, again, the publisher didn't want that happening. Um, so that's my story on that. This is number 20 with a kind of a more legitimate piece missing. And uh, that's great stuff. I would love a, um, not an omnibus. DC does a lot of omnibuses these days. And I can't afford a, you know, $70, $100, $120 omnibus collection. But I would love a, 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 a good, mm, you know, mid-price $20 or $30 uh, trade paperback collection of Tomahawk. I would, I would love, love to have a Tomahawk collection in the um, the old showcase uh, presents format, those those big telephone books, if you ever saw those. So here's the same thing. You know that cover was probably ripped off and returned for credit. Although this book doesn't have a back cover either, so it probably lost the back cover due to whatever kid eventually had the book. And you can see it's been restabled here. But that is Superman. Number 75 from 1952 with the prankster. Where is he? There he is. 
Look at that. And some classic Wayne Boring artwork. Here's a decent condition copy of Tomahawk, number eight. Boy, wouldn't I want that in my collection. Yes, indeed I would. Wheaties. Tomahawk also starred in Star Spangled comics for a, uh, for a while. And uh, Star Spangled also had, what is this book? This is 50s, early 50s, 51. Um, also, uh, Robin the Boy Wonder had his own series, actually, which ran for quite a while in uh, Star Spangled comics. He wasn't always the cover feature, but uh, certainly... Certainly he was around. Two-Gun Kid, number 11. So there's an early issue. Another Marvel Atlas book. Werewolf by Night. And what cracks me up about this one is the price tag, 90 cents. Now, assuming that this book was meant for this bag, at least that's how it arrived to us. Look at that unfortunate color fade up here. Um... But somebody thought uh, Werewolf by Night number one was only going to bring 90 cents. So that sticker's been on that bag for a while, and this book has probably been in this bag for a while. Good old masking tape. It's another way you can tell. See how that's an old-style bag with the extra-long flap? That's probably a Bill Cole bag. And we have here Wild Western with Kid Colt, number 21. And last but not least, the last book in this box, Will Rogers. And again, you see that it, there's no issue number here on the cover. That tells us that it's probably a low issue number. Because again, you didn't want to advertise that this was a, a new book back in that era. And in fact, when we look at the Indicia, this is actually the first issue of Will Rogers, it looks like. Because it says here, uh, formally My Great Love. <laughs> So this is actually number five, but the book had previously been titled My Great Love. And so when they did away with that book, uh, who was the uh, publisher here? Fox Features. Uh, when Fox did away with My Great Love and replaced it with Will Rogers, um, they picked up at number five uh, rather than, than, you know, do a number one but even still didn't put an issue number on the cover, presumably because they didn't really want to advertise that it was a, a new a new book. And uh, this is another thing that you think would go to uh, collectors other than those who collect comic books, but, you know, if you're under 40, do you even know who Will Rogers is? <laughs> I don't know. There he is. There's a nice photo of him. But anyway... There you go. So that is, that is that box. I hope you enjoyed that. I had fun. But until the next video, we always say uh, goodbye, good luck, and please be good to each other.